the dilemma that is daylight savings time is that we get to sleep in an hour extra, but also right now when we normally would be at lunch, we're in here. And so for people who, who like to eat like I do, that's a real dilemma. Other people, maybe not so much. I want to, I've got a couple announcements that I need to make about Lads to Leaders before we get rolling this morning. And that is, um, and I was told to read it as it was written, so I'm going to read it as it was written. Uh, it says, we want to thank everyone again for their participation and enthusiasm for our Lads to Leaders program. Hopefully at this point all members have met with their kids, our mentors have met with their kids uh, or have a meeting scheduled and there is a plan in place. So three announcements for today. Uh, number one, song leading, mentors, parents, and kids meeting tonight at 5.15 before services. That's for boys and girls. So song leading, the mentors, parents, kids meet, and the kids are all meeting at 5.15 for boys and girls. And this won't require parents every single time, but in the starting process, um, it would be more helpful. Um, <clears throat> also, speech, mentors, parents, and kids were meeting tonight uh, at 5.30 before the services. Also, that uh, registration is open, uh, and we must have everybody's family uh, info sheets uh, ASAP. And if you're participating in any event and or planning to go to convention, uh, we need that filled out. And if you can't remember, Brooke has those and so you can ask her uh, if you already turned it in or not and uh, if you haven't where you can find uh, what you need okay so the old question goes like this <clears throat> what do you do when you don't know what to do how do you go forward when you realize that going forward means that life is never going to be the same again. Maybe because some of the pieces are missing. Maybe because things are just never going. In your mind, you understand and realize that things are never going to be that they, what they were before this, whatever this incident is that happened. And sometimes in those moments, we find it difficult to get out of bed in the morning to kind of find our purpose again and to redirect it. We can find it extremely difficult to go to church. We can find it difficult just to function. And in a room like this and in a room this size, there are people in this room who know exactly what that feels like. There are other people who have yet to experience that. One of my favorite preachers said many years ago, I don't wish on anyone the difficulties of life. But I do hope that one day you learn the freedom that comes from realizing your utter helplessness before God. Because there is a sense of freedom. Because when you're before God and you have nowhere else to go, everything that you do and all of your abilities, you've expended every single one of them. Because we have in our minds that we can fix our problems, that we can just dig deep and find it and we'll push through and our problems will be solved. The only problem is... A lot of time that's just not true. No matter how smart you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter how healthy you are, no matter how good you are, there are things that will bring you to a moment that will bring you to the end of yourself. And in many ways, I could argue that being brought to the end of yourself is one of the greatest graces that God could give you. Because it's in that moment that he shatters every illusion that you have, that I have, that we can do things on our own, that we can do things without God, that he is unnecessary. We are driven to a point, as Lincoln said in the midst of the Civil War, I've often dri been driven to my knees in prayer with the startling realization I had nowhere else to go. And those moments forever change not only the way you view God, but the way you view yourself. They show you a God who is extremely gracious and powerful. They remind you and they humble you to the point where you realize, you know what? I'm not exactly who I thought I was. I'm not as good as I thought I was. And this morning, that may be somebody who has come to the end of themselves. And you have realized that there are certain things in this life you are never going to be able to fix. 
And that's a hard reality. That is a hard pill to swallow, but it is one that we have to learn. This morning we want to talk about this very idea when we're in need of strength. <clears throat> when we're in need of strength. And what's interesting is one of the things I've become really sensitive to over the last really 12 months or so is paying attention to the words of the songs that we sing and how in many ways we don't really believe some of the words to the songs that we sing. For an example, when you get into a study like this, as we will here in just a moment, as we talk about and really uh, kind of <clears throat> drive down on this point of our weakness, a lot of people get really uncomfortable with the idea of saying that they're weak. But what's amazing is when you look to our songs that we sing all the time, you will find it hard to find one that does not imply our weakness, explicitly express our weakness, and our dependence upon God. We have to be sure that what we confess is what we actually believe. And that we understand that down at the most practical level of everyday life. So this, this morning and this evening, we're going to look at, at this whole subject together. And I want us to begin, first of all, by discussing a shortage of weakness. How do, why is it that we need strength? Well, obviously, because our strength is shortened, is shortened. It's come to an end. We can't work through it on our own. Then I want us to talk about the source of our strength. And, of course, that's, that's going to be no shocker. That's God. But I want us to really kind of tap into that idea and pay attention to what we mean by that. Because a lot of times we make statements like that and we don't really... Um, you know, it's just a kind of a bland statement, and, and there are no details given to it, no practical understanding of it. And then think about some suggestions for helping to build our strength in God. So first of all, let's think about the shortage of our strength. The first idea under this is the very fact of our weakness we have to accept. One of the things, and one of the most liberating things, is understanding just how many things are outside of your control and mine. Okay? Because we like to control things. We want things to happen our way. We want to be in charge so that we can keep things under wraps. How many of you right now are controlling the beating of your heart? So one of the most fundamental things for us staying alive is something that is actually not in our control. Oh, sure, you can do things. You can exercise. You can do things to try and keep that thing healthy. You can get checkups. You can do all those things in the world. But at the end of the day, every single person who is living, unless the Lord comes back, that heart's going to stop on them. And they're not going to be able to stop the fact that it stops. The most fundamental element of even keeping ourselves alive is something that is beyond us. Sometimes for us to learn that, we may have to be flat on our back in a hospital bed looking up at a hospital ceiling. What about our health? Well, no, you can do things about your health, right? You can exercise, you can do all these things, you can eat right. Yeah, you can do some things to try and help your health. But you're also going to have some genetic issues that are beyond your control. Like it or not. And as, as much as, you may, as we may try and control those things, some things just happen to us. A virus comes in and takes over. And we can't control it. And so accepting that is going to be one of the most important things that we can do in our lives. Because what it will actually do for us, one of the things it does for us, is it frees us from a lot of different worries. Because when I realize that I basically have maybe a small handful of things that I can control, it frees me to stop worrying about everything else that I can't and just focus on what I can and then I know what my purpose is. Then I know how to drive forward. So let's look at some of these areas of weakness that can come upon us. As we mentioned a moment ago, our physical health can fail. Isaiah 38 and verse 1, Isaiah the prophet is sent to Hezekiah who is sick. And he says, look, set your house in order. You're going to die. You're not going to live. You're going to die. 
Some people have faced down those, that diagnosis. Some people have heard the dreaded words that so many people dread to hear when they walk into a doctor's office. Or the doctor calls and says, we need to see you first thing in the morning. Maybe it's some kind of a social thing. A social weakness. In Mark chapter 7, when Jesus heals the man with, that is <clears throat> deaf and he has a speech impediment. You see, when, when you look at the miracles of Jesus, one of the things we understand is that Jesus doesn't have to be present to heal anybody. We've seen that. All throughout the Gospels. I mean, the occasion where he just simply speaks the word and it's done. So when Jesus is interacting with people that he is healing, we need to pay more attention to how he is interacting with them and why he is interacting with them that way. Because he could heal them without ever being present with them. So his interaction with them helps us to understand something of what he's trying to do for that person. Now, <clears throat> this is not a 21st century American society where there are sensitivities to people with physical, with uh, habitual physical issues, okay, or with social issues, or with handicaps, whatever term you may choose to put in there, or challenges. This is a culture that viewed that if this is wrong with you, either you sinned or your parents did that made you this way. And they didn't have programs that supported them and helped them, maybe helped them find a job, maybe helped to pay their bills, make sure they got medical attention, make sure they could eat. They had to beg for what they had. And so, the deaf man who cannot speak, and you can imagine the crazy theories that would be developed about him, right? The deaf man who can't speak has always been a social outcast for something he had no control over. You go into town, when Jesus comes into town, as a matter of fact, why do you think the people bring him to Jesus and say, here? I don't get the sense when I study this text that this is like Mark chapter 2 where the friends are bringing him saying, help our friend with paralysis. I get the sense of saying, here, take this guy off of our hands. And Jesus takes him to the side. And the question we need to ask ourselves is why he takes him to the side. It goes into this social element. He's always been, oh, that's, that's that guy. He can't talk. He can't hear. He's the guy who's always begging for stuff. He's that guy. He's just somebody that's been categorized and cast to the side. And Jesus pulls him aside because he doesn't want him to be a public spectacle. And he treats him with dignity and honor. And communicates to him in terms that he can understand. That's why he puts his fingers in his ears. He's telling him, I'm about to do something about this. This issue that everybody has ostracized you for your entire life. We may have struggled socially for things that are beyond our control. We may have other struggles that are emotional in their nature. In Mark chapter 1, verse 41, and we'll come back around to this one a little bit later, but in Mark 1 and verse 41, the Bible says Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the leper and he healed him, but he didn't have to touch him to heal him. So why does he touch him? When was the last time he had been touched? What do we now know so clearly? Why is koala care and things, why are koala care and other programs and things along that line so important when a child is born for skin to skin contact with their parents? One of the architects of the Third Reich, when he was captured, he was placed in a prison all by himself, giant prison all by himself. And he was allowed one visitor for 30 minutes a month. And they were never allowed to touch. He killed himself. And it's not because it was like some of the others. They feared that they were going to be captured. And so they took a cyanide pill. What the lack of human touch can do to you emotionally is literally drive you crazy. Here's an emotional weakness. 
Jesus takes the time to engage that. Maybe it's vocational. You know, here's the ugly reality of vocation. You can be the best you do at your job, and if somebody doesn't like you, you're gone. You can do things the right way all the time, and somebody else comes and says something about you and cuts your legs out from under you, and they can crush your business right out from under you. Work is difficult. It's part of the fall. Genesis 3, 17 through 19, it's increased. There's, we can have issues with our jobs. I mean, who hasn't had a job? I, I think most of us probably have. I know I have. Where when you start getting closer to the parking lot and pull in, your head just automatically starts hurting. And you're already going through, what fires am I going to put out today? What complaint am I going to have to deal with? Who hasn't had familial issues? Whether it's a marriage issue or raising your children or the extended family. People say, I don't have those issues. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't believe you. I just don't believe you. It's common to the human condition. But if you've ever... If you're willing to admit that you've gone through this, you know the weight that this can carry. And how draining carrying this kind of a burden around can actually be. What about financial? Second Kings chapter 4 and verse 1, you've got one of the sons of the prophets. He was studying in the school of the prophets and he dies. We're not told how, but his wife comes to Elisha and says, what am I going to do? He had taken out a loan and now I don't have a way to repay it. He can't earn money and he's going to take my two sons to debtor's prison. What am I going to do? Many of us have felt financial pressure before, financial weakness, something that has come upon us and swept us away, and it doesn't mean that you were irresponsible. One of my <clears throat> one of the uh, my favorite one of the fav the best men that I have ever served under one of the best ones I have ever served under is to this day still in his 70s, a world-class businessman. He trusted his partner, and his partner turned his back on him. What do you do when people start hurling accusations like fraud at you when you did nothing wrong? Or the IRS shows up at your home and says, you owe us large amounts of money. Now. He did everything right. And it still fell on him. What about spiritual weakness? Surely no one would be arrogant enough to say we haven't struggled spiritually. I mean, that's something that the Bible says very plainly. When we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us in the midst of our weakness. As much as we may want to picture ourselves as a great person of faith, any person that's a great person of faith first began as a person of weakness. Furthermore, what do you do beyond that? In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, one of the greatest servants that God has ever had, slipped into a state of spiritual depression and looked at God and said, please, just kill me. And he wasn't joking. He meant it. He said, just, just take my life. Just let me die. What I have found through the years is that a lot of people struggle with every one of these things and many more. What I've also found is that the majority of them are afraid to ever say it. Because they're worried of what it makes them look like to other people. They're worried what other people think. And so many times we can fool ourselves into thinking that nobody else is going through this. This person, you know, they've got their life together. They're, they're not going through any of this. Think about how sad it is to come to church every week and to sit next to people and you look at them and you think, you don't have problems like I've got. 
And so I'm going to sit here and suffer in silence. Meanwhile, that person that's sitting next to you going, I can't tell you but because you would change the way you look at me, but I've got problems and I can't believe how, how much of your life you have together. And we sit here and we suffer in silence right next to each other. The problems of the world are not unique to us. We all share these same areas of weakness. And sometimes these areas of weakness, they express themselves in different ways if we're willing to finally verbalize them and speak them. One of those ways comes like Jehoshaphat. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, when he and Jerusalem are surrounded, and he offers a prayer to God on behalf of himself and the people, and he says in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12, we don't have any power, we can't beat them. If we go to war with this army, we're, we have no chance of winning. And we don't know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Not only is it a wonderful expression of faith, it's a wonderful moment in the life of a child of God. It doesn't feel like it at that moment, but it is a wonderful moment. As we said earlier, all your illusions of your strength and your abilities are stripped away and you look at God and go, I got no idea. If this gets better, if I get out of this, you're going to have to provide the answer because I don't know it. Sometimes that cry may be something like Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 15 when Eli thought she was drunk. And she said because she was praying and her lips were moving but no, vo no volume was coming. And so he rebukes her for being drunk. And she says, I'm not drunk. She said, what I've been doing is pouring out my soul before God. I've been weeping. I've been telling God all of the things that are going on. I've just poured myself out in front of him. All that stuff I'm afraid to let anybody else see. I finally just let it go in front of God. And listen... One of the most freeing moments in your life will also be at the time when you realize you can be yourself before God because He already knows you. And you don't have to pretend in front of Him like we may try and pretend in front of other people that I'm actually a better person than I am. But when you can sit down in front of God and say, you know it all, you see it all, and this is what it is. And I know it's not right, but this is exactly the way I feel. It's a cry of weakness. It's a cry of admitting to God something. Maybe it's like the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. You remember her? Jesus and a crowd are moving and she kind of climbs up, runs up behind him and says, maybe if I can just touch the hem of his garment. You see, her idea was, yes, I've got a weakness, I've got a problem because I've had this issue of blood and it's not getting any better. It's actually only getting worse no matter how many doctors I go to. And so if I just go and snag the hem of his garment, what she is saying is basically this. She's saying, you know what? I'm not sure that Jesus even knows who I am. I'm not sure God even knows who I am. But if I can just some way just get in contact with God, maybe he would help me. Because what ends up happening in the midst of weakness is we begin to view God through the lens of our weakness. So God is up here and we put on the lens of our weakness and we try and view God. Now look, as I'm looking through my fingers... I can see part of my hand, but I cannot see a full vision of who he is. I can't see a full vision of my hand. And it distorts. I let my problem dictate how I see God. Instead of the other way around. And this woman thinks, God doesn't care about who I am. Does God even notice me? In our weaknesses... Don't we wonder that? Maybe God's forgotten about me. And there are people in the Bible who felt that way. Psalm 13 and verse 1. How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? Or maybe it's like the father of the demon-possessed boy. You remember 
Jesus and the three of them had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and so they come back down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's all this ruckus going on, and Jesus goes to try and figure out and, and to make some sense of what's going on over here. And a father comes to him, and there's a demon-possessed boy in the midst, and he says, look, we've been to everybody to try and get help, and I thought maybe if I brought my son to you, y'all would be able to help him, but your disciples were not able to cast him out. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. What is the Father saying? It's what Jesus has to remind him. You're questioning my ability to solve the problem. And in moments of weakness, in moments of difficulty, sometimes we question God's ability to even fix our problems. This problem seems too big. No one can handle it. And so we assume that because we are helpless and that other people are helpless, that then somehow God must be helpless. Or maybe the most difficult one of them all, we come back to our leper. Of all the interactions that Jesus had with people, especially with miraculous interactions, my favorite interactions are all in Mark. And my favorite one of all of them is this one in Mark chapter 1. Wish we had the time to set the scene on it. It's beautiful and pitiful and emotional and everything all at once. But you remember the leper comes and approaches Jesus, which is against the law of Moses, right? He's not supposed to do that. He's supposed to remain at a distance and actually warn people that he's an unclean individual. And so he approaches Jesus, and whereas most people would probably expect Jesus to say, what are you doing? Get away from us. He just simply runs up to Jesus and says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You picture a man who Luke says was at the end of his life, was full of leprosy, which means full-blown. He's going to lose his life to it. A man who is very badly physically disfigured, most likely. And he gets in front of Jesus, and in contrast to the father of the demon-possessed boy, you remember he said, if you can do anything, help us. This leper knows God, knows Jesus can help him. That's not his question. He says it, doesn't he? You can make me clean. I don't have any doubt about that. But what is the one thing he does doubt? He doubts whether or not Jesus loves him enough to help him. If you are willing... If you care about me, I know you can help me. I'm just asking you to care about me. And sometimes we get ourselves in some of our weaknesses and messes that we create, and we can look at God and go, does he even love me enough to help me? Yes. Because as he interacts with that leper, who is again, Jesus is standing and he's kneeling in front of him. Face probably disfigured. Everybody around probably shocked. He's probably, as he is kneeling down and face down in front of him. Nothing in the text says this, but everything in my mind as I'm playing this out in front of my head. We're not told what Jesus does in particular. We do know that he touched him. But you almost have to wonder, knowing who Jesus is and knowing his ability to connect with people, you almost have to wonder that with a man bowing at his feet, he doesn't get down on his, on, toward his knees and tap him on the shoulder and lift his head up and say to him, Buddy, I'm willing. Be clean. Don't ever doubt I can love you. I love you more than you could ever know. That's, look, that's who God is. Tonight, that's exactly what Isaiah is going to show us. That when we have problems, and look, I'm not 
of all people, you should know I'm not an anti-book person. Okay? I'm not even anti-certain self-help, time management, building habits, ethics, atomic habits. It's a book everybody should read. Don't buy into some of the garbage he says, but it's a really good book. Um, All those types of things. But what we're going to see is this. When we are at moments of weakness, we don't need, here are three things to do to make it better. We don't need, okay, my life has fallen apart. What we do not need is to hand a person Dr. Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Again, a good book. That's not what people need. What people need in their weakness is to see God and nothing else. Because when we hand self-help books over, we're still trying to say, Hey, buddy, you can do it. Buck up. Dig deep within yourself and find it. And you'll deliver yourself from all of your problems. The only problem is there's not a word of truth to it. We are not that strong. We're not that strong. And we must have it. The strength that God supplies to help us in the midst of weakness. Just a handful of passages off the cuff. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. If you're going to serve God, if you're going to minister, minister as the ability or the strength which God supplies. 1 Peter 4, 11. Who? God. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, I thank my God who has strengthened me and enabled me for ministry. In talking about contentment in in Philippians chapter 4, he says, I can do all things through Christ who, man, he just motivates me and I pull my bootstraps up. No, Christ strengthens me. Or, you know, in Christianity, where it's a call to go to war, right? There's spiritual warfare. So I just, I just buck up and I trust my training and I put my armor on and I go to war in my own strength. Absolutely not. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Because your strength isn't good enough and my strength isn't good enough and it will fail you. And that's why we sing in the song, Soldiers of Christ Arise and Put Your Armor On, strong in the strength which God supplies. The arm of flesh will fail you. We need God. The problem is inside of us and the solution is outside of us. In God himself. So the question for us this morning is, are we willing to admit our weaknesses? Are we willing to admit that we're not actually as well off as we'd like to think we are? We're not as strong as we'd like to think we are. Spiritually speaking, we're not the spiritual giant that some people would, we would like some people to believe we are. We struggle with sin. We fight with it. And there's not a faithful Christian alive who doesn't struggle with it and fight with it. If you're not fighting with sin, one of two things is happening. Either you're dead or you've given yourself wholly to sin and don't even realize it. But as long as you live, as long as you are faithful to Christ, as long as I'm faithful to Christ, we will fight sin to the day we die. And if we try and fight it in our own strength, we'll lose every single time. But Jesus died for us when we were still without strength. Romans 5. And so if I'm willing to come to Jesus, the source of all strength, and let him infuse his strength into me, 
then I'm able to stand. If I come to him with a penitent faith, confessing Christ to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of my sins, or maybe as a New Testament Christian, willing to confess my sins before him. Listen, that may be a a private thing. That may be something we want to pray about together without going into the details and specifics, certainly. Or maybe I just need strength for life because it's hard. Whatever it is, we want to make sure that if anyone has that need, that you are connected to God in the way you need to be to serve you. And if we can help you this morning, we want to as we stand and sing this song.